nice to coming out for Co-op Fest. Um, this is the first time we've ever put anything together like this, and uh, we're hoping to generate some interest in cooperatives, what they do, what they can do, how to develop them further in this neighborhood in Milwaukee and region. Um, my name is Nikolai, and I'm very pleased to introduce our three panelists for the day. Um, but just a few quick notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, if you haven't yet been over to Garden Park, um, which is just a couple blocks this way on Locust Street. Um, at Garden Park is where uh, you can sign up to get your lunch ticket. Um, if you want to register to become an owner of any co-op, you can do so over there and to be entered to win a raffle at the end of the day. Um, and there's, that's also where we'll be having lunch. It's at the River West Public House. So if you haven't had a chance yet to head over there, get your program for the day. We have lots of other workshops and exciting things happening today, including a tour, um, a presentation uh, by Common Ground Healthcare, which I'm sure you'll mention, yep. uh, following this workshop, and tons of other things. So I hope you can stick around and enjoy the things that we've got to offer you today. Um, all the workshops are free and open to the public. So, um, so I'm going to introduce our three panelists for the day. They'll be speaking about the origin stories of their particular problems that they're involved with. So we've got furthest nearest for me, uh, Don Matla from the Willie Street Co-op in Madison, uh, Mike Wu from Just Coffee Cooperative, also out of Madison, and recently out of uh, Claw Coffees. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, Darren Allen from the Brands Making New Common Ground Healthcare Cooperative uh, right here in South Eastern Wisconsin. They'll be providing you with some more information about how to make us one of the questions. So keep your questions in mind. There will be time for a Q&A after each of them uh, speaks to you. Thanks so much for coming out, and I hope you enjoy your day. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dawn. I'm from Willie Street Co-op, and um, I can talk for a really long time, so I'll like, try to stay on track here. Um, so Willie Street Co-op is a grocery cooperative, and what is really interesting to me, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins. Um, we started in 1973. I wasn't part of the co-op at that time. So I, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the beginning, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the last three years because we've, we've changed so significantly in that time, and I think it's really important for the history of this um, kind of project. So Willie Street Co-op was started as a buying club, like a lot of grocery co-ops, in 73, and for the first few years, it operated as a worker collective and moved into becoming a consumer co-op eventually. Um, was run with volunteer labor, and when actually it moved from volunteer to paid staff, it was like paid staff, you know, it was like you could get $50 <laughs> a week if you wanted it, kind of stipend. Um, and so the, the co-op started on Willie Street, the east side story still is on Willie Street, but it moved to a couple different locations. With every move, membership grew, staffing grew, sales grew, expanded offerings. Um, so kind of just to summarize really quickly the beginning, so there's a, a few years where um, there was no board of directors. It was it was really pretty much like you, 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 you kind of throw a tail, but you're shaking your head. You're up. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of, um, and then there's also a lot of folks who are, who are owners who were, who were owners at that time. It started with a $5 lifetime membership and so people like to remind us of that from time to time, which it has changed. So, um, so the year, it was in the year, I think it was 82, when um, the board of directors was elected and then also a general manager was hired. And then in 1984, which was about 10 years after it began, the ownership voted to raise the membership fee to what it is currently and still at today which is really great, it hasn't changed. It's, it's $56 for us, uh, is that right? Uh, for a, a individual ownership or $90, $98 for a household ownership. So 
Um, so that's been the same since 1984. It will, it will not change unless the ownership votes to change it. Um, so kind of to give you a sense of what, I like to tell the story a little bit with numbers, even though generally numbers aren't the most exciting thing, I kind of find it to be a little interesting to when we're looking at history of co-ops in general. So in my opinion, the co-op started in 73, in kind of like the second wave of co-ops, is kind of was what I call it. Like a lot of, it's like a lot of hippie enthusiasm for like cooperative endeavors, and it, it got off the ground at the time, and a lot of co-ops went under in like the 80s and early 90s, um, mismanagement, financial, financial um, downfalls. And the Willie Street Co-op actually posted losses throughout the 80s, which is an interesting story, but yet we maintained some and, and expanded during that time, too. Um, starting in 1999, the co-op story changes pretty, starts to change pretty significantly. So from 73 to 1999, there were, were at the end of that time frame, there were about 50 staff members at that time. Um, ownership was at about 4,000. 4,000 members. Um, at that point, the co-op decided it needed to go and grow into a bigger space, so it moved to change locations, and um, within the first year of that move, the ownership doubled. So it grew about five, about roughly like 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 owners. So in the and what is what's happening? What I what I think of is interesting in the story is that with every kind of transition like this, we're seeing like exponential growth. And so when you have something that's kind of a slow growing process over all of these years, and all of a sudden you kind of take this big jump, um, there's a lot of things that have to catch up. So from 1999 until 2010 is an, also an interesting story. Um, Staff grew from 50 to 150, so tripled in 10 years' time. Ownership grew, so 4,000 when it moved, 20,000 owners at the end of 10 years. And so we're seeing all of this rapid, rapid growth. Um, membership, owners grew, owners voted to expand, that was like a big thing, um, and voted to open up a second retail site, open up um, like a commissary, so uh, an off-site kitchen, um, which also has off-site offices, and then to remodel the original location on Willie Street, or what is now the original location on Willie Street. Um, and we kind of did it in a backwards process. The In about 2005, the off-site kitchen was opened. Um, 2010 was when the second retail location was open, and we're now just beginning the remodel of the original location. So as you're following kind of the numbers, 2010, this is when actually I started at the co-op, it was at 150 staff members. We opened up a second location. We were at 20,000 owners. In the first month, we grew 4,000 owners. So it was like this huge leap. And then um, in the last three years, we've um, doubled our staff, so we're over 300 staff and um, doubled, essentially doubled our sales. So went from $20 million in sales to $40 million in sales. So this is like this really weird, difficult to follow kind of history when you, when you think about it. And I, I like to tell this part of the story because it's kind of like we're in this like really strange, like epic growth time. And I also am seeing this with a lot of other people that I'm talking to, credit unions, like kind of like a third wave of co-ops that's happening right now. It's really booming, so there's a lot of resources out there. And I think this story is really interesting because how do we maintain the, the what, are, what we were founded kind of on? How, how do we maintain these principles when we're a 31,000 owner consumer co-op with over 300 employees, um, $40 million in sales. Like, how do we stick with these principles that were kind of the, the beginning? The beginning. So, um, I tell this story about the history, and we look at photos, and we talk a little bit more about some of the ups and downs that have happened um, for everyone that's hired into the co-op. So, it's part of my job. I, I'm an educator, and I work in the co-op services department, and we're always looking at ways to um, keep keep true to these, these, these principles that we, we all share, common our ends, um, our ends policies, our, our bylaws, and um, 
I'm just fascinated. I still, I still am trying to wrap my head around that beginning history and, and also talk to people when, who were there in the beginning to kind of say, how do you think we're doing? What do you, what do you feel is different? Do you feel, do you feel like you're still engaged? Do you still feel like you have a voice? Is this still your co-op? And what is your, and I think that critique of, of growth and of kind of expansion is, is interesting when you hear people to kind of talk about, oh, you're becoming more of like a corporate entity. It's an interesting concept because that's really important feedback to listen to because something about that means you're not being heard. And so that's like a really important point to engage with. At the same time, can we still engage 30,000 people? Is this, is this still, like as we grow, as we grow, as we grow, you know, that tension between growing the co-op model and making sure people still stay engaged. So I like to, I like to look at that in the course of our history. So what is this going on? <laughs> Myself and Matt Early, um, we uh, were young, <laughs> didn't really know each other, uh, but for uh, both of us were attending the meetings of Community Action on Latin America, the Latin American Solidarity Group that was focused, had started in 1973, interestingly. Um, and their goal was to promote community action focused on the issues, the politics, and the impact of United States foreign policy on Latin America, particularly Central America. Um, Matt had moved to Madison, sorry, Matt Early is my co-founder. Matt had moved to Madison about the same time I did in 99. He brought with him a relationship and an interest in uh, the Zapatistas in Mexico. He had been to Chiapas, he had been to the autonomous municipalities in Zapatista country, and uh, brought that relationship to Cala, to Community Action on Latin America. Um, so it's pretty fertile ground for, for, for uh, people who are interested in Latin America. You know, let's go and engage and, and meet the Zapatistas and find out how our two communities can work together. So uh, in 2001, no, 2000, December 2000, six people from Community Action on Latin America from Madison went down to Chiapas and spent about three days in the autonomous municipalities. It's, it's a really long path to get there. You, you, for, well, for one thing, you're in a very politically tense environment and you're participating with, you know, for all intents and purposes, the rebels, right? You're going into their protection. Uh, there's a very tense situation there at times that can flare up. And there's a lot of just, um, random and sometimes um, uh, yeah, random opposition or resistance to people participating from the north in what's going on in uh, indigenous communities in Chiapas. So it was dodgy, it wasn't terrible, but you know, you go to the end of the road, you walk for about six hours, and eventually you're in the communities. And as we were there, we talked about how the two communities could work together. What are the ways that we in the north could support the work of the Zapatista, people in the Zapatista community that we had visited, the autonomous municipality of Santa Catarina is where we were. And we heard over and over that they were coffee farmers, they were going to start a coffee cooperative and sell their coffee into the fair trade coffee market. They had heard about fair trade, they knew it was a better deal, and they knew that it represented um, an improvement over standard free trade, um, invisible trade practices, right? You know, and so they wanted to, from the grower end, build those connections, have that relationship, and see that reward, better money for your uh, work and better money to provide for your family. And we thought, okay, great, we've got a mission. We'll go back home. We will look around for coffee roasting companies that are interested in buying coffee from our friends down in Mexico and try to just bridge that. We'll just try to facilitate that relationship. We walked back to the road, got in the truck, went back to the local town that's sort of the headquarters for people when they are visiting the autonomous municipalities, uh, a little town called San Cristobal de las Casas. And there are gringos there who have been, 
engaging with the Zapatista community on and off for a long time, and, and we were able to sort of take counsel with some people who had really good advice for us. And they said, a lot of people come to Chiapas and they leave determined, with, with the exact same determination that you have, to go back and find somebody to buy the coffee from these growers. And what you need to do instead is go home, buy some coffee roasting equipment, join this coffee importing cooperative called Cooperative Coffees, and get Cooperative Coffees to purchase coffee from this Zapatista grown, uh, coffee grown cooperative. And oddly, I'm sure we've, everybody in this room has had really interesting, really engaging, really clear, detailed advice. That's exactly what we did. This is exactly how it worked. Um, the beauty of, having, of joining this coffee importing cooperative was that a little small startup company can only buy a pallet or two of coffee. When the cooperatives uh, growing the coffee sell it in lots of 250 bags, you know, which is 25 pallets. So um, there's no way that we could have a big enough impact to say, yeah, let's bring a whole container to the United States. But all of the 15 or 20 coffee roasters that were part of that cooperative were able to um, get together, say they're interested in that coffee, understand the, the political implications of participating with those growers, still support it, and then import the coffee. So we went home, we bought some coffee roasting equipment, we monitored the progress of their growing cooperative with our coffee roasting company. We, we started as an LLC because um, we um, we didn't have five people. You need five people to um, make a cooperative. So for, for about two years, we were buying coffee from the importing cooperative, and then eventually the growers that we met with that inspired us to start this business got their cooperative built and started exporting coffee that we were able to buy from their importing cooperative. So I know there's a lot of cooperative and a lot of lines in there and you can explore that if you want to but but we're really excited to be able to say as a fair trade coffee roasting cooperative when we sell it to a grocery cooperative it comes from the grower cooperative it goes through an importing cooperative it goes through a roasting cooperative and it goes to the consumer through a grocery cooperative you know but for a transportation cooperative to make it all happen it's a pretty pretty successful chain of cooperativism that goes in an international product that is traded um, as, as much in the world, measured by dollars, as oil is. So it's, it's a really uh, uh, high potential impact commodity, right? There's, there's millions, hundreds of millions of coffee growers in the world. If you can have a positive impact on coffee growers as a, as a community, um, you can really change the conditions on the ground at the deepest tips of the grassroots for people and um, create healthier economies, cultures, um, and countries, and just more stability for everybody. Um, yeah, sorry, I went off of origin into a pitch, but um, <laughs> that's, that's um, yeah, so that's how we started as an LLC. Uh, about four years into it, we realized that cooperativism was a very natural extension of fair trade values, and we wanted to be expressing fair trade values as much as we could, defending them, improving them, making them work in as many different ways as possible. So it was just a natural thing to move from being an LLC right into cooperative. And I know that's not, um, a lot of times people just start as a cooperative. It's, we've heard over and over it's kind of unusual to go from LLC to co-op. And we, I was laughing when Don started talking about not having a board for so long and everything. We didn't do strategic planning. We didn't recognize that there's this long road in front of us that goes to the horizon. We were sort of looking, you know, 100 yards ahead when we should have been looking miles ahead. And we are now going through this process, just forced almost by circumstance, to improve all of that. And, and we're in the process, there's some interesting conversations we can have here about our journey and a lot of ways that we can learn from uh, all of the experiences in this room. So we're really excited to be here and really appreciative of our request for seizing the moment and making this happen. So thank you, and I think that's 15 minutes. All right, uh, I'm Darren Allen, I'm with the Common Ground Healthcare Cooperative. Um, our origins, uh, I, I guess I would characterize as twofold. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we, uh, our grassroots uh, began um, from an organization that, a community organizing organization called Common Ground, uh, that is predominantly in Southeast Wisconsin. And, and Common Ground is an organization made up of small business owners, faith-based organizations, nonprofits, uh, that really champion 
different social issues within the community. Uh, and, uh, you know, and many different, you know, whether it's election uh, uh, rights, uh, educational uh, uh, issues uh, for you know, elementary uh, school kids, whether it's, you know, lunch programs or what have you. Uh, uh, some of the other uh, initiatives are neighborhood redevelopment, right? So they purchase and work with banks to buy a bunch of foreclosed homes and uh, refurbish them and put them back out on the market. And, starting the Sherman Park District uh, to revitalize neighborhoods, bring small business owners back in instead of letting homes just dilapidate and turn into crack houses. Uh, so uh, one of their more recent initiatives uh, is an initiative called Fair Play. And so as folks in our community know, you know the Bradley Center is 20 years old, so therefore it must be ripped down. Because <laughs> it's uh, and something brand new has to be built. And at the expense of taxpayers, right? That's that's how it works. The NBA got from the to pay for anything. So they want uh, the consumers to, or the the, uh, the, uh, the folks that live in the community to pay for it for years, right? So we're paying for Miller Park still, right? That's 2017. I think that bill's paid off for the taxpayers. So uh, so common ground as an initiative. So you know we're going to champion this thing, and we're going to call it fair play. And, and the initiative is sure we can support your initiative, but we want 150 million dollars from the NBA to come in to refurbish all our schools in the uh, Greater Milwaukee area. If you want a nice place for your kids to play, so do we. And that's so that's just an example of some of the initiatives that they get behind and they champion, and they're very good at organizing. Well, since they're an organization made up of nonprofits, small business owners, faith-based organizations, healthcare has always been uh, a, a very uh, strong initiative for them because the challenges, as many of you know, that purchase health insurance, no, costs keep on going up and up and up, and you're getting less and less and less value for that. And in, in the healthcare world, there's kind of a, that disconnect, right? I mean, I think most of us say, well, you know, I don't mind paying more if I'm getting something out of it. And, you know, with all this money that is going into the system and all the money we spend as a country, right, $8,500 a year per person in this, in this country, right? That's double every other country in the world. So we would assume that's okay. We're living to 120, 130, right? No, we die just like everyone else at 78, 79. So we, we spend more and we get a lot less, right? So that's been the environment of healthcare. And uh, so, so Common Ground has, has tried to move this initiative and they started trying to build or figure out a way to uh, organize a, a, a purchasing cooperative, much like uh, your organizations here. Uh, and, you know, and to build from there. But that's hard to do. And a purchasing cooperative, you're still tied to uh, essentially a for-profit company because someone has to underwrite your business. Someone has to take ownership of all those policies and, 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 and be the back-end insurance company. So that wasn't going to work. So, so that's part one of the origin. Part two of the origin was the Affordable Care Act that was signed into law in 2010. And, uh, and, and I know that there's a lot of uh, negative political rhetoric when it comes to health care reform that I think we're all very accustomed to and used to hearing uh, every single day in the news. But the law actually has some incredible brilliance in it. And, and even though I, I know that's probably counter to what you've heard, uh, but there's a lot of smart things in that law. And uh, one of the aspects of the law was the creation uh, or the formulation uh, of uh, cooperatives. Consumer operated and oriented plants. And uh, so the idea was in many, many states in the country, all that's left are for profit companies in the healthcare space. And there is not a lot of competition because right now there's only five large health insurance companies left in the country. There's a, there's a bunch of small regional players, but in most uh, parts of the country, it's really five major players. So this, this whole initiative, uh, you know, as part of the law, was this $3.3 billion pot of money made available uh, for loans for the creation of cooperatives, nonprofit cooperatives in every state. So Common Ground saw that as an opportunity. Uh, instead of doing a purchasing cooperative, actually build an insurance company. Uh, so they made an application with the federal government. And 
and uh, in 2012 secured a $56.4 million loan. And that's a lot more than the money that you know that you folks generated. But when you take a step back, we're building an insurance company and you have to have solvency in order to do that because you have a lot of claims coming in and something has to protect the consumer. So you, you need that money. But it is a loan. Uh, it, it, it does have to be paid back to the federal government. So it's not giveaway money that was characterized by uh, many folks uh, uh, in the, in, on the political side. So, uh, so the, the loan money was secured, and uh, you know the uh, common ground started uh, building the organization and, and finding folks that are uh, have been in the industry, been and have a lot of experience uh, on the health insurance side. Uh, so our chief operating officer. Uh, is a 38-year veteran of the industry, or chief operating, or that's chief executive officer, chief operating officer over 20 years, lives in Madison, worked for Dean Health, started the Farmers uh, Health Cooperative, so a lot of experience and knowledge, a wonderful woman, you know, Kathy Mahaffey, uh, chief financial officer, experience from the blues. I have been in the uh, health insurance industry uh, for the better part of 20 years, uh, 15 with WellPoint, for profit, five years with Assurance Health, uh, for profit. So, so the, our organization is coming together. We've opened our doors October 1st, and we're selling policies right now. And the, the, what makes us unique in the health insurance world is uh, our organization is part of the community, right? So, people that are buying insurance from Common Ground Healthcare Cooperative. Your money is here. It stays in Wisconsin, right? We're a, we're a nonprofit organization governed by uh, policyholders, right? That are elected by other policyholders. So, so the whole operation methodology is very transparent, right? So there is no, you know, we don't pay CEOs eighteen million dollars a year like the for-profit companies do. We don't. We're not beholden to shareholders to make sure that their uh, 401ks are flush with money. And by the way, money that is spent here that goes out right to other parts of the country. Uh, it, the money is here, right? And it is in our best in interest uh, to, uh, as members come on board, to thoroughly engage with those members, create a very uh, high touch experience for our membership. And not just from the perspective of we want to make sure that you, you feel good about what you purchase, but it's also uh, being focused on the benefits of health, meaning it's not enough just to have an insurance policy in this world. You have to be an active participant in your health. If you are not, you get sick and you die. If you, and in our world, right, if you get sick, as our collective community is, we're paying the claims. If our claims are excessive, rates and premiums have to go up. So it becomes in everyone's best interest that's coming into our organization to be active in their health. If you're active in your health, you don't have high claims. Okay? The reason why we have such high claims and so many sick people in this country has been the access to health insurance. When you don't have health insurance, you don't go to the doctor because you're afraid that the doctor's going to say, uh, you, I think you have something wrong and I need to run 17 tests. And you say, I don't have the money. To run seven, so they people just don't go. And eventually, they do go right into the medical system, usually in the back of an ambulance, yeah. through the emergency room, and right to ICU. Okay, if we create access to health care, which is now what the law is all about, then you actually can go seek care. We can actually engage with you to make sure that you're doing something about your health. So, that's our message. This is a, a very unique opportunity as a, as a health insurance organization to have a much greater connection and commitment to the membership, unlike uh, what I have worked with over the last 20 years on the for-profit world. So, and at 11.15, I'm doing a workshop on the Affordable Care Act over at the Public House uh, for folks that are interested in knowing what it's all about and, uh, you know, other than what people have heard on Fox News. Okay, so <laughs> no, I'm not here. <laughs>
prison cooperatives where people begin to work for a cooperative within uh, the prison and then move out into the community where there's a community part of the cooperative and they buy in. Needless to say, um, first of all, there are no models that I know of in the United States, Canada, uh, and some. Um, but secondly, um, I'm not sure, since one's dealing with a very impacted indigent population, where finances would come from. So I'm wondering, did you draw in the, on the knowledge of, for instance, the Center for um, Cooperatives at the university, were they of assistance, were there other organizations that were of assistance, and secondly, where did capitalization come from? Um, yeah, I can speak to the Village Street Co-op history. Um, I actually talked to the general manager before I came to just kind of get some of like, what were some of the on-the-ground details of how this went down in the 70s? And her perspective was that um, at that time there was a lot of re like people recreating the wheel over and over again, like just just in the sense of at that time frame there wasn't a lot of resources as opposed to now that there are like the Center for Co-ops and FCI, um, all these, a lot of just um, develop supporting organizations. Uh, in terms of um, capital or startup um, money, because obviously I mentioned it was a $5 lifetime membership, so that wasn't going to get anything out of the ground at that point. Um, she had said that there were bond offerings initially, and um, when she became part of the co-op, she was looking at the books and like, why are we still paying bonds 10, 11, 12 years later? Like, they, could, they were able at that point to start affording to pay them off. So um, I know the, the bonds, like the, the, the bonds have been a huge part of our growth, and so as I was describing the last three years, we had a very successful bond drive in 2010, or 2009, um, it was a million dollars um, in bonds. I think it was $250 a piece um, that you could buy the bonds, and it was a three, either three, five, or seven year time period to pay it back. So we've already paid off the three year ones, and they they were all sold a million dollars worth in a month. They were it was like really really successful, and so that's where I think like when you're looking at the time frame of how things started in the 70s versus like the energy giving going towards co-ops now, like there is a lot of there's a lot of resources out there that people are looking at and saying, yeah, this is a great We uh, two questions was capitalization and support. Yeah, two <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> to start the business, um, the year previous, uh, Matt, my co-founder, was in grad school. And he was able to save a little bit of his student loan to invest. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, um, <laughs> and I had been hit by a car, so I <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend that approach. <laughs> um, so that got us off the ground. That, that got us equipment. That got us equity that we could then leverage to get a loan, and that really that got us our buy-in into the importing market. Um, since then. Uh, we, we have, at the current worker owner level, we have a $5,000 buy-in. We sell community stock. We're going to uh, pursue the idea of bonds. We don't really uh, have planning for that, but that's just one of those things that's on the horizon. We've tapped um, UW Center for Cooperatives at various times to come in and just do organizational consulting or even like how to run an effective meeting or some of the larger, uh, just tools for thinking about a democratized workplace and all the implications of it and how to, how to navigate building it and owning it at the same time. And uh, right now, because of the developments that we've been going through as a business, we're, we just closed this deal where we went from, we're, we're going to increase our sales by 40% this year. We went from a 13-person cooperative, well, business. Uh, to a 23 person business and we need to go from just being six worker owners to 23 worker owners so we're in the process of rationalizing that and making it fit um, the reality at just copy and so to, to your question about support there are in this second wave of cooperativism 
there some some people quite smartly have gotten into okay, here's what you need to do for your cooperative as you build it. Here's how you organize it. Here's some tools. And there's a lot of consultants in the region and in the country that we've been able to just have a one-hour phone call with, or that we're going to maybe tap as a professional consultant to come in two times a year or something like that to, to meet with us as we go through this process. Did you want to add anything to that? No, no, actually I think it's uh, one of the things that I hope someone asks, and if not I will. You know, <laughs> uh, just that strategy to get that word out, what were the things that you felt were most uh, successful? I mean, and your growth is incredible, right? I mean, what you've experienced in a short period of time. So I have one year, and then one year. Now that people tell me who they, so I know to put you in some. And one. Okay. Um, uh, sort of a follow-up to, to the last question for uh, the history. Um, and so the, what you were saying about the bonds might might answer this. Right? I was mm -hmm. curious about how you said, especially in the '80s or during times when you're posting losses, but you're still expanding. So I guess maybe it's maybe the bonds was part of the answer to that. But how is that possible? And maybe sort of also a related question that, that I had was, um, so you said in, I think, whatever it was, 82, that you started to have a board and a manager. What was the legal status? Was it legally a co-op before then? And how, how did you, I mean, what was the legal status and how did you operate without a board? But I think co-op requires, the legal co-op requires a board. So yes. Yeah. Before 82, what was this legal status? I'm not sure if it was just flying under the radar, because I don't, I, when I when I looked into this, no, there wasn't anybody specifically that could tell me like when did we move from a worker collective to a consumer co-op. I believe it was organized in '74 as a consumer co-op, but just flew under the radar at the time. Um, so there may have been like a worker collective board, like a you know stand-in kind of, but then became as ownership grew, there became the, and, and it moved from that like worker base. To the consumers driving it, I think. So I've seen that in other co-op stories where it starts with like a very worker centric, and then as, as it grows, it kind of gets pushed out where the where the it, it changes its form or it comes into like a hybrid form of some sort. And so I think that's as far as I understand from the story, that's kind of what happened. Is that then when it became more consumer driven, that's when the board ended up being elected because the board is um, consumers. In fact, um, I will I should know. I do work for the co-op, but I also ran for the board, so I'm also on the board of directors. And we have space for two workers to be on the board. Um, you have to run, you have to be elected by general ownership. It's not like a staff position. Um, so there is space for that. It's a, it's a very strange position to be in. I enjoy it, but it's strange. Um, and as for the 80s and the kind of the, the downturn of the economy, as far as I understand, um, the part of I, I believe that part of the the losses it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that far of a loss to take it under, but that the whenever we do go through the any kind of expansion, we're always going to go through loss. So I think it was like up through the mid '80s, it was it was like posting losses, but just. In, in enough, in a, in a way that it, the expansion was probably proposed as like, oh, we'll, we'll probably turn turn more over if we can expand a little bit more, and like, and it was in it was basically the expansion at that time was moving into Del like the, the, the space next door, so like broadening the space. Um, I don't know the details of the finances at that point. I, I have studied a few other co-ops like. Why did one co-op succeed, whereas another failed? And one of the things that has come up, which I thought is, it's not very straightforward, but um, one solid argument is the need to educate people, and the need to be educating people to take a role in owner ownership, and that like co-ops will fail if they don't engage their owners in the reality that they're participating in a co-op. So giving them being like, take that voice, take that space, this is a co-op, what can we do to educate you more? And it actually it helps because in in my very small department, I have one of my, my coworker Katie is here as well, 
we have, we have a very small five-person department for this very large now co-op, and our job is very much around education and advocacy, and we that's our argument. We're like, no, this is a really, really important work. We have to be kind of making sure that people know what it means to be a, a member and owner, and what do they, what do people want out of us as a co-op? So, so I would argue that, that those things aren't straightforward connection, but they're really, really important to consider. I, I, I don't really have a good answer. And uh, I'll just jump on to the first part of your question, which was, um, we, yeah, we, we established ourselves as a cooperative. And we didn't, like I said, you know, we were only looking a couple hundred yards ahead rather than miles down the road. And we knew we had to have a board. And we were, we were really, you know, we're, we're motivated by activism and we're sort of, anti-authoritarian, totally <laughs> horizontal, like the weirdos. And we were like, we just randomly put down on the official forms who the board officers were sure. from, from member mm -hmm. And we would change it every year, you know, just because we had to uh, assign people roles because we had to fill in the forms, but we didn't take seriously the function of those roles. And as we, you know, we should have been looking further down the road because those are actually important roles. And um, as Nikolai had mentioned, I was recently on the board of our importing cooperative called Cooperative Copies. That's where I learned a lot about the relationship of board to staff and board to vision and planning and, and the role of a board in a cooperative. And we're trying to apply a lot of those lessons into co-op copies, or just copy now, as we um, develop our board and you know, take that next step in our cooperative process. Okay, mine's a very practical question, uh, but it's like five parts. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, can I ask, I'm going to do a time check. We're, like, we're gonna go they can answer, just they can pay, just, just, okay. So who are your three highest paid employees and how much do they make? And as far as employing benefits, health care, pension, and educational opportunities that you provide for your employees? Well, I, I, I think probably our three highest are the, the Chief Executive Officer, the Chief Operating Officer, the Chief Financial Officer. And to give the specifics, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Um, you know, a lot of those types of questions, as an employee, I'm not privy to necessarily the board is. I'm not. Uh, but I don't sit on the board. So, but I, I mean, probably guess those are the three highs. So the, that's number one for you. There's other parts of it. But. The other part was the uh, employee benefits, the people that you hire or who work for the co-op, um, health care co-op. What is their health care benefits? Do they have a pension and do you provide educational opportunities? Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so setting up a 401k and uh, right now um, we don't. Uh, we have uh, whatever health insurance program you uh, had, that's what you have until January 1st and then they'll have Common Ground Healthcare Cooperative okay. coverage, so they'll they'll become uh, part of the company and part of that membership. Uh, and you know, a lot of those uh, we're 16 people organization. Uh, so uh, the, the educational components, I think, a lot of that will evolve and come into play. I think those are the intent the intentions to make sure you're providing educational opportunities for your for your employees and, uh, and staff, but. Uh, it's we're s relatively new, and uh, a lot of that hasn't really been built in yet. Our highest paid uh, level is the highest management. So we we were a bunch of overly horizontal uh, weirdos who didn't want to have any hierarchy built in, and we realized we have to have at least a manager level. So we have we have a management level. It's we don't really have good terms for it. So we use CFO, GM. We have uh, 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 a director of operations, and we have a marketing manager. Those are the the, uh, uh, the two founders, myself and Matt, really are in that cohort. And then it, it goes down from there. So it's it goes from twenty five dollars an hour down to ten dollars an hour, and it goes and, and we pay uh, seventy percent of GHC healthcare benefits at a, at a pretty decent strata in what they offer um, for people over thirty hours a week. We offer educational opportunities 
uh, mostly in the form of workshops, small business uh, school for small business on campus that stuff. We do um, um, business uh, uh, like personal and business coaching, and we have some consultants that work with us on how to do our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. um, I can, I'll start with the staff thing. Um, there's staff benefits. There's a huge reason why people will say that the co-op is a great place to work. It was voted as like a top place in Madison. Um, starting wait, starting ages, I think, 10 something an hour. And every everyone who's over 24 hours has access to health insurance. It's fully Full time is 32 hours, so 32 to 40 hours, um, and then you get full health benefits through Group Health, which is a co-op in Madison. Um, you get, if it's 20, if you work 24 hours or more, you can get um, pay part part health insurance. Every staff member has a 20% discount for shopping, and then there's a lot of other like just side benefits, like we have profit share in a um, good year. We just had it this year. Um, I believe, so every, every job, when there's a job opening, there's a pay scale that's released so you can see what the, what the, um, realm, like, what the, what's that word, like the, realm, the range, the range of the jobs. And so, it's not disclosed, I don't know if there's any kind of information that discloses publicly what people individually are being paid at a managerial level. Um, I know or at least I did know briefly what the general manager was making, which is the top paid employee because I'm on the board of directors. I'm not clear if I can disclose that. Um, I would if I, if, I, if I could tell it. I'm not sure if it's public or not. Um, I could tell you how much I make, which is about $15 an hour. And my, my pay is probably like an app, like a middle ground. There's a lot of entry level employees. Um, I'm not in, in the managerial, um, I'm just kind of a side person, <laughs> educator, and then there's a general management team of about 11 folks, and a lot of folks who've been working there have worked there for 15, 20 years, and the, the way that pay is structured is sort of like a, it's sort of to, like on the higher end for like the entry level jobs, and on the lower end for managerial jobs, that's like kind of how it's set up, so that it's, it's more competitive for the entry end less so, but you have kind of all the benefits and the work environment to consider. So I'm sure a lot of people have topped out at their range mm -hmm. at this point, and there's no there's no change of that. So I know at least one of my coworkers in our department has that's been the case. So. We do a patronage, uh, which is like a profit share to co-op. So the surplus is split between the patrons of the co-op, which are the members of the work Right now, two questions. Does anyone else who has a question from the designer for a question? Go ahead. Um, well, what's kind of remarkable to me about all of your origin stories is that they kind of have this common thread of taking root and being kind of propelled at different points in their life cycle through other movements. So, not the cooperative movement, like the fair trade movement, Latin American solidarity. I would, you know, the countercultural kind of 70s communal movement. I'd even say maybe in the late 90s, early 1000s. Um, or 2000s would be like your health food, kind of local food, that kind of stuff. And then of course the Affordable Health Care Act, which we call that a movement, you know. Um, but I feel like what's interesting now is we're entering this time where after the 99% movement and after the Arab Spring, that um, the cooperative movement is becoming compelling in and of itself, mm -hmm. to the point where like, I think, um, I've heard Margaret say this too, you know, there are people that come up and they say, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to start a co-op. I have this need and I want to do this thing. Oh, it costs me to do it. You know, that's maybe the, the best way to enter into development. But so I'm I'm really curious to see, you know, how are we going to harness this like compelling cooperative movement energy? Um, so I'm also curious if you're seeing um, folks that are coming to you solely because they're interested in the cooperative movement, they find that compelling, and how you're harnessing that energy. Well, it's still coming. First of all, I want to comment on what Don mentioned about this educational awareness piece, uh, because that's what we've been doing, right? So I, I, I do these ACA presentations, which we'll be doing shortly, uh, mostly just to make people aware. Uh, what I find most interesting is I've been out in the community and, and talking to small business owners and just talking to people 
is that this whole notion of, and I don't want to call it a reaction, negative reaction to publicly traded companies, because there's a lot of good publicly traded companies do the right thing. But I, I, I think that people see the abuses, they see the negative, and they want to kind of keep things more local and focused in their communities. And I think that that is really what has been resonating very well with people. Uh, before, we were chatting before the meeting started, and uh, the, the actual, his cost of health care went up a little bit, and 3% is attributed to the Affordable Care Act. And that's, that's understandable. Someone's going to go up because the way, you know, we're now, we're now letting everyone in. It doesn't matter what you have, and instead of excluding people. But what I think people are starting to put together is, well, the rates didn't go up. You were telling me it was going to go up triple, and it only went up, you know, 20% or whatever. And so I think people are starting to make that tie. We could have been doing this years ago. Why? Why, why did you, not till now, they haven't. So I think people are starting to put that together and say, I've kind of been screwed here. And, and, and so that is adding, I think, to the momentum. And, and I think that that's probably what adds to the momentum of your organizations, too, is that people see there's got to be a better way. And I want to have more connectivity with people that are in organizations I interact with. And I think that's really the true benefit. So I, I kind of agree with your, your, your assertion that how you're seeing the world. That's how I see it, too. Yeah. Um, we, 50% of the people we hire, we know people get hired them because they work in a position where they get a look into the cooperative and they're like, oh, you got a job with me? I'd like to work there. So I can't say if it's because we're a co-op or because we're a copy roasting or because they, the hours because they're the teams or the um, we, we don't get a lot of people who explicitly say, I'm here because you're a co-op, but for other businesses that are already co-ops. There's a, there's a lot of people who totally get the importance of working co-op to co-op. And, uh, you know, we were activists in our origins. We were in Madison, Wisconsin, which also conveniently is like, almost geographically right in the middle of this great grocery cooperative. And, you know, I was astonished to find as I traveled around the country that not every big city has this vibrant co-op movement going on. It is unique to the upper Midwest and it's totally set to spread, but not every city is spread around for it. I find it's really, I find it really curious. And um, so, you know, to your question, we do get people who come to us, but they are already kind of inside the community. Uh, but, you know, we market ourselves pretty heavily as a co-op. We always say just copy dot co-op. You know, because that's our that's our extension. We're proud to have that extension. It's because we're a co-op and it communicates immediately that we're a cooperative. And I think that resonating from all the ferment recently is uh, more that, that word just comes up more, people pay closer attention to it and have this desire to just build a co-op that they don't know what they want to do. I mean I think that's good energy. It just has to find good soil to do. I guess I would also just throw out there, um, personally, like my own interest in co-ops is from working in nonprofits for many years and finding that nonprofits were always struggling to have money to do the work and people got, would get really burned out and it was like really, it's really important work that a lot of nonprofits are doing even though the nonprofit model is problematic in a lot of ways. Um, becoming, I didn't know this when I was hired into Willie Street, but being part of a successful co-op that's not struggling every day for like to have enough money is it gives people the the ability to be creative in a way that um, I have I've honestly never worked in an environment even like working for small businesses where you're just like really trying to make it every day um, nonprofits where you're really kind of chasing the grants and whatever. And not saying, I mean, I'm lucky because I kind of came onto this organization at a, at a very prosperous time um, for it. But I've thrown out a lot of ideas in my role, and that can there's enough there's enough space and enough energy and enough money to, to actually kind of push some of those ideas forward in a way that I'm sure 20 years ago or 30 years ago wouldn't have been true. But um, so, I, and then and when I encounter people who are really into co-ops, it's, it's a lot of just like, 
yeah, screw the banks, I'm joining your credit union. And like, <laughs> screw that, I want control of my food, screw that. You know, it's a lot of just like, which I think is, is rad, and I'm super excited about it. But. <laughs> So let's say thank you to all. Happily gave them their questions, but they'll come talk to you. Uh, fine. But um, so just so everybody knows, the next workshop starts here at 11 15. There's another one just down the street, and another one where Darren will be over at the public house. So if you haven't gotten a program, check that out. It's on the back table. If you haven't registered yet today for Co-op Fest, please go and check out the Co-op Village and Garden Park just a couple blocks down, and you can join all the co-ops that are here hosting. We have raffle tickets, so if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah.